morning. Um, Arnie and I are both uh, delighted to be here and um, thank Tetra Pak for inviting us to come and speak. Um, we got a little bit of feedback during the break to speak slower and to make it a little bit more informal. So this is rapid flexibility that we're going to try to demonstrate uh, today. Um, a little bit about um, why we were asked to speak. Um, Hilco, if you don't know, is the uh, largest asset um, valuation and disposition company in North America. What that, um, what that means is that uh, we look at a lot of companies that fail, uh, more so than companies that succeed. So that's the two lenses. We look at end-of-life companies. We basically do uh, dispositions. And uh, we look at some leading edge companies that kind of get ahead of the curve and want to take um, capacity out. Uh, we do all asset classes from receivables, inventory, machinery equipment, real estate, intellectual property. Um, I think you all have heard of Hostess. We now have the assignment to uh, sell the assets at Hostess. We were just awarded that um, prior to um, the holidays. Um, we have a lot of numbers on here, but uh, basically, to Steve's point, we actually liquidated all the assets at the GM and Chrysler plants that were um, in Chapter 11 recently. We do thousands of dispositions every year. Um, on the retail side, over $150 billion of uh, inventory liquidated in the last half dozen years or so have dealt basically with um, virtually every Fortune 500 company. Um, we do this uh, globally. So we have a unique view of the world. And what Arnie and I are going to do is uh, walk through some case studies. We might not necessarily follow exactly what's on the slides because we were told to make it more interactive and informal. Um, John, I, I just add to yep. that that um, one of our groups um, does valuations. And it does valuations in connection with banks lending to companies as well as to private equity groups acquiring businesses uh, and then for their financing purposes. And uh, as, as a result, we produce about 1,500 of those reports a year globally from Singapore to the east, I guess, to, to London to the, the west, depending on, on your orientation. And in each of those cases, we're looking at a business plan. So we have a lot of experience in uh, reviewing business plans of different sized businesses, everything from, let's say, Goodyear at, at the high end to retailers like uh, Borders. Um, and we have uh, made certain judgments over time as to which business plans seem to make sense and why. Um, and some of the themes we'll talk about is uh, are the process of reaching a decision within a business. Uh, as Steve pointed out before, the quality of the management that goes into making uh, that decision, and then uh, the quest for cost containment, which is a key component of many of the companies that we look at, and some of the pitfalls of trying to execute and achieve uh, those cost savings. On the retail side, which is sort of irrelevant to a company like General Motors, we've worked with a lot of businesses that you might have shopped at uh, that you no longer do, such as uh, Borders, uh, we, we took that company down globally. We were the ones who shut the stores. Um, Circuit City, Linens and Things, and the Sharper Image, just to name a few. Um, and in each of those cases, we got intimately involved both with the, the business to understand why it was failing. And these are businesses that obviously did not find a successor owner. Uh, and we also uh, put up our own capital. So uh, while well, I'll call us short-term private equity players in that regard. Mm -hmm. Very short-term. Maybe flip ahead to another slide or two. Um, yeah, I think we can go to the next slide as well. So um, in the last 24 hours, we've talked a lot of themes. They're common to uh, what we've seen. Um, I, I think the major takeaway that we have from our business is that uh, achieving cost competitiveness is a continuous process. It has to be ingrained into your culture. Uh, as uh, Steve spoke about, uh, you can't have a culture of denial. You have to face what the facts and reality are. And so a foundation of a successful plan, we feel, is that one is you have to look at the long-term impact 
of your um, cost reduction plans and productivity related capital expenditures. The return on investment, what do you get for it? Uh, we've been on a lot of plants that are what I call legacy plants. If you try to walk through them, you can't even see a clear aisle. So these are one-off decisions that made sense at when they were made, but in the context of your overall efficiency, it was probably not the right choice. Second, you have to have an external focus, a focus on your customers, uh, in terms of your price value uh, equation. Does it make sense to the customer? Um, and also, how does it compare to what else is out in the um, marketplace? And then uh, third, um, another thing we've talked about is time matters. You have to make these decisions in a timely manner. You can't have this culture of denial hoping that the market will come back, the volume would come back. Uh, you need to move uh, quickly. And I guess in the context of red ocean and blue ocean, we kind of have a black and blue model that a lot of these companies have, have failed. Um, quick question to the audience. Um, in, in the course of your business careers, have you ever worked for a company that uh, faced the cash crisis? <laughs> a couple. Okay. Uh, have you ever worked for a company that um, uh, contemplated a bankruptcy or a significant restructuring? A few more. Um, have you ever worked for a company that failed? Okay. Um, I spent the last 20 years of my life, including a few years at Hilco, uh, working in the environment of companies that were distressed. Uh, and uh, one thing I learned was not to confuse the tipping point with the underlying cause. Uh, in all, all the 250 or so companies I worked for, um, the period of time in which I spent with the business, which could have been from a couple of months to a year, um, was an unusual period of time for the company and had people acting funny because they were acting in ways that were not normal to their everyday business life, which was working in a crisis. And crisis, you know, someone once said, it's a bad thing to waste a crisis. And, and I believe that very much. Uh, and I think people who have gone through the crisis come out better, but you only want to do one or so in your lifetime. It's not a really good thing to go through time and, time and again. And you learn a few things from, from crises. And we're going to take you through a couple of cases uh, of companies that were dominant in their marketplace, were innovative, some were 100 years old, some were public, some were private, and somehow or other, they all lost their way. And I found them at their worst moment in time. Uh, but in that window of time that I spent with them, I think I took away, ultimately, uh, I'm a lawyer by, by training, so I don't have any of the management skills of the folks from Bain or investment banking skills of Steve and others. But uh, a couple of kind of hard-earned lessons that other people learned through their failure. And most of the companies that failed actually had products that succeeded in the hands of other people. So one of the things we want to talk to you about and maybe focus you on, and it may not be on your radar screen today, and you may not be facing any of these issues, but you may at some time in the future do, is that there's a way to get through the crisis and there's a way to build your business um, model better. And you know, in the, in the quest for cost containment, it's also as important to figure out how to execute that plan because in the search to improve your margin and to be more competitive, uh, you can kill your company. And there are a couple of cases here that will show that. So let's start with Binks. Binks Manufacturing, when I got there, was a 100-year-old business. It was the inventor of the spray gun for painting. It was a public company. It operated in 22 countries uh, from Asia to Europe. South America, North America. Um, and it was dominant in, in its field. Um, among its competitors were Illinois Toolworks, which is a much bigger company, um, and which ultimately was the purchaser of Binks. So Binks was based in Chicago, uh, and it was unionized. It had an insular board um, made up of the founding family, although it was a public company. And uh, its tipping point was, uh, one day when uh, it announced a giant loss um, after having promised its banks with whom it just entered into a large agreement that it would show a significant profit. And uh, banks tend not to like surprises. And uh, they uh, immediately cut off the company's lines.